If you want to understand your paint and understand how color works, you need to understand chroma. Chroma is one of the three main dimensions of color. It's a fascinating one. Very often it's overlooked, but it's crucial for painters. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, obviously, if you know about my videos, you know the three main dimensions of color, hue, value, and chroma. Chroma is what we're going to be talking about today. But I want to make sure that you understand that chroma is different from coloring power or tinting strength. Let me show it to you with two pigments. There we go. Here we have two purple pigments. This one is cobalt violet. It's PV14. And this one is transparent violet magenta PV19. So it's a quinacridone magenta. All right. So here is my cobalt violet. And as you can see, it has a higher chroma than my quinacridone. And if you know anything about chroma and value, you know that if a color gets darker, its chromatic range is diminished. All the colors have a favorite value spot where they can be the most chromatic. Obviously, in this case, this cobalt violet is way more chromatic than this one. However, it still has much less tinting strength than the other. It's all about chromatic power. It's all about the tinting strength. And the tinting strength is the ability of the pigment to retain its identity. So it's potential to be the dominant pigment when mixed with a different pigment. Usually you can mix it with white, but let's see what it does with another cutter, another pigment cutter and let's try to pick this cadmium yellow here, for example. So now I'm going to incorporate the same amount of cadmium yellow in both cases and see how it goes. So with the quinacridone, you can see that it pretty much, it gets more on the red side, but it pretty much stays as it was originally. Not much has changed. But with this one, look how it's completely dominated by the yellow. It almost disappeared. It just produces a slight tint. But if you compare it to the original yellow, you can see how much the yellow dominates here. So in this case, which one should you choose? As a painter, obviously, you're not necessarily interested in the color that has the best chroma but more in the cutter that has the best tinting strength, so the more cuttering power. Let me just say that this cobalt violet is certainly one of the weakest pigments that you can find. But I find that it's very useful to also mix with a cutter, a different cutter, this yellow, for example, a green or whatever, because it really shows what pigment dominates the most. And you can also have a grid, like a cross table, and you take all your pigments, you mix them all 50-50 and you make a table compiling all the results and you'll see which of your pigments are the most dominant and which are the weakest. So there you go. Chroma is just a visual component of how we see colors. So it's just a visual dimension. It has nothing to do with how pigments mix in real life. And tinting strength is a physical property, chemical property of the pigment itself, making it more dominant than others. For you as a painter, you're most likely going to be interested in pigments with a high coloring power rather than just pigments that have a high chroma. In fact, most of the times, the most chromatic pigments that you're looking for as a painter are very dull on their own, very dark like that. This is a this is a phthalo green, one of the strongest pigments. And as you can see, as, as soon as you pop it with a little bit of white, you can reveal its potential. It's a very, very strong cutter, maybe too strong for some people, but at the least it has a very high chromatic power. But as you can see, the raw form of the pigment is this very dark, very dull thing. You wouldn't think that this has so much chromatic power, but it does. Now, obviously, if you want to learn more about this kind of theory that I'm talking about, you can check out the link in the description where you can get to my PDF on color theory, or you can also get the full color course if you really want to have a deep dive in color mixing. Now, let's talk about chroma in the context of color mixing. There is something absolutely crucial that you need to understand. Keep this in mind, it's super important. Every time you mix cutters, the chroma drops all the time. 
if you want to keep your color as high as possible, you want to reduce the amount of mixing that you do. Every time you mix colors, there is a drop in chroma. It's always like that. It always happens. No mixture can result in a color with a higher chroma than any one of the starting colors that you have on your palette. So let's see it on this color wheel here. On this color wheel, the more to the center you get, the less chromatic you are. So let's take two highly chromatic pigments. Let's take a red, for example, and a green. As you can see, when you mix them together, theoretically, you should get this line, even though most of the time it's not a straight line. As you can see, when you cross like that, your resulting mix ends up being in this range. So a lot less chromatic than the two pigments that we started with. And also, no surprise there, the closer two pigments are from each other, the more chromatic their mixture can be. It's easy to understand with this line here. And the further apart they are in the color wheel, the more drastic the drop in chroma can be, even to a point that it can be gray. And actually, when you mix red and cyan like that, you actually get a neutral gray. So if you mix colors that are very close from each other, the chroma drop is going to be negligible. But if you mix colors that are very far apart in the color wheel, the drop in chroma is going to be huge. Now let's talk about color mixing and organizing our colors in a scale. Which one of the color scale that you create from the darkest to the lightest should be the most chromatic one? Which one should have the most chroma? Now this is what I call the chromatic arc, chromatic bow, or the bow curve, whatever you want to call it, it forms this kind of bow shape here from the darkest dark, pure black, all the way to the lightest light, pure white. And as you can see, it should connect those two in an arc form like that. And this is what you get if you try to paint this local cutter here. So this local skin tone cutter is there. And as you can see, this local cutter is the most chromatic. So the highest chroma that we get on this entire thing is here. And obviously skin is very specific. Maybe you are blushing, so it's actually a huge shift. But in theory, if the skin has the same cutter all over the place and is very uniform, this is how it should look. Your local cutter should be the most chromatic one and all the rest should slowly get to the lowest extremes, the darkest dark and the lightest light. In this case, the cutter that's on top here is the local cutter. This one here, the local cutter is there and all the other cutters are slightly lower in chroma and it slowly decreases until it reaches perfect black, which is zero in terms of chroma or pure white, which is also zero here. And this is what I call the chromatic arc or the bow curve. If we want to talk about chroma, the final chapter should be about harmony because chroma is an absolutely crucial dimension of color to think about when it comes to color harmony in your paintings. What you don't want is this here with all colors looking super bright, extremely chromatic. All the colors are full chroma. And it looks like nothing. It looks very ugly because all the colors are maxed out. Frankly, this just makes me want to throw up because, I mean, all the colors are over the top. There is no hierarchy in the chroma and, and it just doesn't work. I often use the image of the weigh scale. The most chromatic color weighs more than the dollar one. So obviously, if you want to balance it out, the dollar color has to occupy more space and the more chromatic cutter, because it's more dense, it's full of vibrancy, it can have a much smaller painted area, but have a lot more impact. And this is how you balance it out. So based on this, I came up with three main ideas when it comes to chroma. I was inspired by 
actually by music theory, but whatever. Just use them if you want. The first idea is the tonic. So the tonic is the main color of the painting, the one that you want people to focus on. The next one is the dominant. So this is the one that occupies the most space and can be slightly duller and weak. And finally, you can incorporate accents. And the point of the accent is that you can modify it, you can change it, or you can remove it. It doesn't really fully break the coherence of the color composition. It's really up to personal taste. If I couldn't dare to have an analogy here is chroma is, is like the sugar. It's like sugar, eating sugar. It's good and all brings this good taste but too much sugar is not good for you and you actually want some consistent food to actually fill you up you can't just survive on pure sugar and just only eat candy i know some of you might be tempted but no it's not good for you and technically the tonic is just this sweetness the sweetness of the sugar the the, the sugar for the eye the dominant is actually what fills you up the tonic is the sugar, but the dominant is the dough of the cookies without the sugar. And the accent is just the extra little bit of spice, the little spiciness, the secret ingredient that just makes the taste so much more interesting. So for example, this is what I would mean with the dominant. You can see how much space it takes and the tonic takes a lot less space but actually this is what your eyes immediately focus on you just want to stare at the lady maybe the accent here would be the reddish socks i don't know there is no real accent let's see an image with an accent i really love to take this image to illustrate this concept see how the green gray brown dominates here it's kind of an olive green very dull takes most of the space of the painting and occupies you know the most surface area but it really provides a great canvas on which the red of the main subject can stand out and pop because of this balance this equilibrium between taking less space being more powerful being more potent having more coloring power and the accent in the end just to bring a little spice here make this dramatic battle scene more epic with the fire works really well and i find that there is a, a just a perfect tension between the dominant the tonic the accent the battle in the background the geometry also works really well in this painting it's an absolutely amazing painting harmonizing colors based on their chroma, not just based on their hue. Basically, the hue can be anything. If the chroma is well controlled, you can pretty much make a painting and make any hue that you want work together, as long as you have a good weight distribution between dominant and tonic. <laughs> All right, that's it for this video, my friends. If you want to see more, you can click here, and I'll see you for the next one. And as always, joy and inspiration to you. Bye.